Um, so in this panel, we'll actually dive into one of the topics that came out as a major point of interest in the first panel, which is what about this question of regional differentiation, regulatory risk, development questions. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about in a lot more depth right now. So I'm going to start by giving a brief presentation of section four of the report, which dives into this topic. And then we'll hear from a panelists, a group of panelists representing perspectives of uh, real economy, but also asset managers and asset owners. And they all have uh, some level of exposure or interest in um, the transition in different regions, particularly emerging markets. So we'll hear from Laura Hillis, uh, who is Director of Climate and Environment Responsible Investment at Church of England Pensions Board. We'll also hear from Roberto Fernandez Albendea, uh, who is Global Head of ESG at Iberdrola. And finally, we'll hear from Annika Brewer, who is a sustainability analyst at 91. After that, we will have a brief Q&A. Um, so there'll be a chance to ask some questions, and I encourage you to start thinking about them as we go through the presentation and the panel. So as Carmen mentioned, um, we wanted to respond to this growing interest from investors to explore uh, regional analysis. What about um, these factors that are outside of companies' control, how is that affecting uh, their corporate climate action performance? So we explore in particular three questions. So are there geographical variations in corporate climate action based on the ways that we measure this uh, at the TPI Center? And if there are variations, what are they? Is there an income pattern as well? The second question is, what are potential explanations for these patterns? And the final question is, what can we do as a provider of climate assessment tools to enable um, this challenge to be addressed in a more informed way? Um, and during the panel, we'll deepen that question a bit further and ask, what can investors do? What kinds of nuance can they integrate into their decision making um, to make this uh, work in a way that is, is smooth, ensures a just transition, um, and actually leads to real decarbonization outcomes all over the world? So we have here this uh, rather beautiful map uh, prepared by one of the analysts in the team um, where you can see the management quality performance of companies across the world. There are a few key patterns you can see. Um, we have statistics of exactly what share in which region are aligned with different benchmarks. Part of the idea of this is to also visualize the extent of coverage that we have now. Um, so one thing that you can see is uh, European and Japanese companies on average do better on carbon performance. You see clusterings of purple, which is level five. Um, a contrast is seen in China, for example, where companies are on lower levels. Uh, in fact, 70% of companies are below level three. Um, switching to uh, carbon performance, um, to give your eyes maybe a, a bit of a visual reference, 30% of these dots are green. So that's the 30% of companies are aligned with 1.5 degrees in 2050. That was the statistic that Simon explained earlier. Um, so with that in mind, again, we're seeing some regional uh, patterns, in particular in Europe, but also in Australasia. About two thirds of companies are aligned with either 1.5 degrees or below two degrees, so the green or yellow. Two thirds of companies is a quite large share, but as we've discussed, this also um, depends on intermediate targets and other measures on transition plans of whether these targets are credible. Um, another point is that in North America, it's about half of companies that are aligned with 1.5 degrees or below two degrees, but about the same share, basically 50%, is either not aligned with any target or doesn't even have sufficient disclosure to be assessed. Now, if we group countries by income group, what is the pattern that emerges there? So now we've looked at um, this group of countries that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, we use the World Bank uh, income groups. So there's high income, upper middle, lower middle, and low income countries. For now, we have a very negligible amount of companies headquartered in low income countries. So we've set that aside. And we've grouped middle income countries for the purpose of this also because of the sample size. So the main illustration and observation that we can make is that there is a statistically significant um, improvement in management quality and carbon performance amongst companies that are headquartered in high income countries relative to those that are headquartered in middle income countries. And this carries through on both management quality and carbon performance. This is important, really important to analyze and address as we've heard in the previous panel because we want to avoid choking off finance, uh, financial flows to emerging markets in developing countries because this is both crucial for a global just transition but also exceedingly important for uh, actually meeting net zero because we know that there's immense economic growth and population growth in these places. 
Um, so ensuring that financial flows do get there to enable the low carbon transition is very important. Um, coming to the second question, what might explain the geographical patterns that I just discussed? One thing is availability of resources that correlates strongly with the income question. This can be access to capital, but also access to technology and other privileges that companies may have in uh, developed markets. Um, another point, which is number one here on the slide, is the regulatory context. And I'm setting that aside because I can jump into that um, in a bit more detail in a moment with the rest of the slide. So alongside those two factors, there's also possibility that the sectoral composition in a given country might be different across different regions. So for example, in the Middle Eastern region, the companies we assess there tend to be oil and gas companies because those are where that sector's high market cap companies are located. And we know also that there's a systematic relationship between being an oil and gas company and having lower carbon performance outcomes. Um, some other factors that might explain this are stakeholder pressure um, and different corporate governance norms. If ownership models are more um, family owned or more uh, publicly owned, that can affect the pressure that companies face and how much they prioritize climate action. These are all hypotheses, hypotheses so these are all possible explanations. Um, and what we were able to do this year, which is really exciting, and I was glad to hear in the previous panel that there was already interest in the ASCOR project. So what we were able to do this year is overlay the corporate assessments with our national policy assessments that we assess as part of the ASCOR tool. So ASCOR stands for Assessing Sovereign Climate Related Opportunities and Risks, and the TPI Center is the academic partner of the investor-led ASCOR project. So in that context, we were able to analyze specifically for companies that are headquartered in a country that has a net zero target, a carbon pricing system, how good is that carbon pricing system based on some of the questions you can see in the slide, um, or whether the country has mandated climate related disclosures, does any of that have an impact on the corporate action? And it does. Um, so this is preliminary analysis, it's mainly correlation for now, but we plan to go uh, deeper into this question. Um, but what we've found is that this is statistically significant that the company, a company who is headquartered in a country with any of these policies and net zero target carbon pricing or climate related disclosures being mandatory has a higher management quality and or a higher carbon performance outcome. So coming now to the final slide, this is answering the last question. What can we do about this? What should be done? Um, what might be done, and in the panel we'll go a lot more into detail um, on this and also other factors that relate to this challenge and, and different regional um, contexts. So one, one possibility is that when we have tools like management quality, um, perhaps investors might consider exempting companies that are exclusively based in emerging markets from certain very high ambition level indicators. This can be a challenge because we also understand that the TPI data wants to be consistent. You want to apply a consistent framework across different um, regions and companies and so on. And that is a, that's a selling point of the tool. Um, however, you might think about this in terms of investor expectations. And that's what we're going to hear from the, some of the panelists is there is a need and there is a value in adjusting investor expectations to companies that operate in different regions. A second interesting way that we might um, refine our climate assessment tools to address this challenge is by developing more granular regional emissions intensity benchmarks. So what we have on the slide here is the um, regional carbon performance benchmarks for the electricity sector. So this for now is the only sector where we go beyond just global benchmarks to show what does the pathway of a company based exclusively in the European Union, what does, it pa what does its pathway need to look like to align with 1.5 degrees? And as you can see, it's very different from the pathway that is to be expected of a company based in the non-OECD region, which is roughly a proxy for emerging markets and developing countries. So two things I would draw your attention to is um, the benchmark for the non-OECD group, it starts much higher. That's because the current electricity grids in these regions is, tends to be higher. And that changes how much you can expect of, the country, of a company in those countries by 2025, let's say, relative to a company that's based in the European Union, which already has a much lower emissions intensity level currently. Um, the second thing I want to draw your attention to is the net zero deadlines. So on a global basis, to align with 1.5 degrees, 2040 is the deadline for the electricity sector, which, as you know, is much earlier than the net zero deadline for the rest of the economy. 
And that's because this sector has particular um, technological possibilities and, and opportunities um, to decarbonize faster. And we'll hear a bit about that from Roberto. Um, however, companies that are based in um, European Union or North America, they would need to hit net zero in 2035 to align with 1.5 degrees. So there's an earlier deadline for those companies that have um, lower current emissions intensities. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, I wanted to ask a, a sort of open-ended question to each of you. Uh, maybe we can go uh, in this order, basically. Um, so can you start by describing first your role and secondly how your organization approaches in general terms this uh, challenge of the low-carbon transition in different regional, developmental, um, and policy contexts? Thanks. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Annika Brower. I am a sustainability specialist at 91. Um, 91, for those of you who don't know, is an asset manager, previously in Bestec Asset Management. Um, we are a global asset manager, but we were born and grew up in emerging markets. We were born in South Africa in 1991, hence the name, everyone always asks. Um, but it's an important part of, you know, our, our history and our story is a very important part of answering that question because um, so much of how we have grown is through emerging markets, through raising capital in emerging markets and deploying capital in emerging markets. But also, um, so much of the problem when we're thinking about climate and transition lies in emerging markets, um, it, whether you think of it in terms of um, exposure, vulnerability, or potential growth of emissions and growth of the problem. So we approach the um, you know, climate and transition, and we very much approach it through an emerging market lens, um, one of of equity, of justice, of, um, and, and, and very much, very, very sort of front of mind for us is increasing financial flows into these regions and into these sectors that require capital to transition. My role as sustainability specialist, I sit within a sustainability team that works with both our investment teams on integration, using tools like TPI, using data from TPI and ASCO on both debt and equity to integrate um, climate and transition thinking into our investment decision making. We also work with our clients, and I know some, some of our clients are in the room today, um, with capital allocation and whether that is within their existing portfolio. So, you know, if a client has um, a specific mandate to invest in transition or in climate within emerging markets, we work with them on, on how to do that. But we also design new strategies um, and new products that can help our clients achieve their own targets in a way that is both commercial and has um, strong impact and strong returns. Um, another important part of my role, I think, and something that 91 has, has increasingly done over the last couple of years, is to advocate for the commercial, um, I guess, make the case for commercial investing in emerging markets. I think the last, you know, since sort of the 70s, 80s, most of the cap or the financial flows that went into um, Africa and Asia, specifically into infrastructure and into climate, was ODA hmm. or MDB financing. And what we have seen, um, and you know, through our story, we have seen there is an enormous opportunity. And so to use our networks, our platforms, and tools to generate the proof points and socialize the proof points of actually there is an enormous opportunity that is within your risk profile mm. that generates the return and has and has impact. Mm. Thank you. Laura. Thanks everyone for having me. Um, so um, I lead climate and environment for the Church of England Pensions Board. So we're a relatively small pension fund, about 3.3 billion pounds in assets under management, and we look after the pensions for current and former workers for the Church of England. Um, so we very much take an approach to climate where we think about ourselves as a universal owner, and we think about how we can address systemic risk, because we, we really subscribe to the idea that we're exposed to systemic risks as they play out across the economy, particularly into the long term. And when I think about 
our pension holders, the youngest one will um, start, they'll enter retirement in the 2070s. And so if you think about kind of our, our liabilities to pay pensions, they stretch well into the end of the century. And so when you think about how climate change and other risks play out across those time horizons, that's very much how we think about, um, that, that very much informs our strategy and approach. So what that has meant in practice in terms of what we've done on climate change has been a couple of different things. We've done a lot of work to try and build out the infrastructure to help um, us understand what transition looks like, which is one of the reasons we co-founded the TPI um, a few years ago. We've also been really active on stewardship. We, we do, do our own stewardship. We've in-house it. We do our own voting. We've been quite active in, on that topic. Um, and in particular, on stewardship, we've really tried to look at the key levers that need to really change in order for us to see a whole of economy decarbonisation. And so for that reason, we've looked at things like um, demand side engagement, so looking at engaging with the companies that are big, the, the biggest users of fossil fuels, but also looking at thematics like lobbying, which has already been talked about a bit today. We see that as a really key issue. And so to date, we probably haven't taken a hugely differentiated approach when we've thought about companies um, that are domiciled in different markets. And that, that's in part because the data really hasn't been there in the way that we might have, have needed it to be. But we've started to think about this in a more nuanced way. And I guess the reason for that is if you're an, an investor who is thinking about climate as a systemic risk, your biggest fear right now should be the developed world is going to decarbonise and emerging markets are not. Because that is kind of what it looks like at the moment. And if you look at where emissions growth is coming from, in the last decade, 95% of emissions growth came from emerging markets. And I think we have to expect that's going to continue. I mean, all the modelling says that it will, but you also have um, you know, countries where just an enormous number of people are entering the middle class. It's getting hotter in those countries. They want to buy air conditioning. I would too. Air conditioning is great. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that people suddenly want when they enter the middle class. And so we're seeing this massive um, increase in emissions from those countries. And I think the other part to this is also um, biodiversity risks in those countries as well. You know, these are parts of the world that have um, some of the most important uh, ecosystems. And so we need to kind of be thinking about those two things. How do we? as investors who have this kind of systemic risk hat on, really target getting finance into those markets in a way that really helps them decarbonise. And so as a result, we've started to think about this in a more nuanced way, and we're thinking about it on stewardship. So thinking about how do we change our voting policy? How do we adapt the way we do stewardship? How do we get into those markets in a bigger way in terms of actually having a voice, which is tricky, and we can probably come back to that, uh, but also on the capital allocation side as well, which again is tricky and challenging if you're a pension fund, but it's really, really critically important. Mm. Thank you, thank you. For Roberto, if you'd like to start by introducing yourself, and I'll, I'll bring in actually the question maybe, because your position is rather different than the other two panelists, so maybe a slightly different question would, would be helpful to, to kickstart. Um, so, as a real economy actor, as an electricity utility with operations across different countries, um, different regulatory contexts, can you share some examples about how these different regulatory environments might affect your company's climate efforts and, and other operations? Sure. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations to the TPI team, which has been, made such a good job. We all need uh, good data, so this is very welcome. The question is very pertinent indeed because uh, I, I, I've been working for the company for almost 30 years, so I can bring an industrial perspective, a utility perspective. This is all I have with me today. Uh, regulation is the key factor for a company like us uh, to invest uh, and is a key factor, uh, therefore, to uh, promote uh, the investment in good, uh, renewable, sustainable uh, generation fleet. Uh, transition into an energy model, uh, in our view, and I think most of us agree with that, but not everybody, uh, would bring uh, fantastic benefits. Environmentally, it will decrease the carbon emissions, it, uh, therefore it will fight the climate change, it will decrease the use of water, it will uh, protect biodiversity. Uh, socially and economically, it will create uh, local jobs, uh, local resources. The cost of electricity coming from renewables is cheaper than coming from alternative sources. Um, so this trend may continue. How do we get to the net zero? We think that electrification of the overall economy is the answer. I come from a utility ticket for that, but uh, we believe, strongly believe so, because now we have the technology. Uh, so if we are not progressing as, as a society, as a, as a planet, at the right speed, why not? 
and it is curious to see because we have the technology, uh, we have technological solutions uh, which are uh, clearly effective and possible to invest today for the utility sector. For other sectors, it's not so clear, but we have solutions, we have emerging solutions, and they can be implemented. So, uh, what do we miss? Uh, touching on national targets. National targets is fantastic, but national targets need to be deployed in effective policies. You have a fantastic national target, you don't have the policy, you're lost. So how those national targets deploy into policies is the key factor, and policies deploy into regulations. Why is so important? Because the policies set, send investment signals to investors, you investors, and us with the, the, the companies that use your money to invest, okay? So uh, under our experience, this is a key factor. And it's curious to see that not always there is a correlation with GDP. The best regulator for us is Brazil is part of the, let's say, risky part of our portfolio. And they have such a rigorous process that I would love this process to be implemented uh, in other uh, regions. Uh, so in practice, we respond to those signals. Uh, a company like us, we have plenty of opportunities to invest, to decide alternatively where to invest. We operate United States, Spain, United States, UK, Brazil, and Mexico, and some other countries in Europe, and growing in countries like Australia. So it means we have alternatives. We respond to, this, to, to those incentives analyzing long-term value creation for shareholders. Uh, the equation risk reward ultimately depends a lot on the market uh, vision, but a lot on the stability of the regulation. And we have plenty of ideas. Uh, and those ideas are universal because the relevance of the regulation is the same in an emerging country or in a developed country. First of all, you need stability and predictability for that you need a well-established and participative regulatory process, okay? And a good uh, and a stable regulation process means lower cost of capital. And lower, lowering cost of capital means increasing the, the, the attractiveness of the, of the investments, okay? Second, market interventions should be limited to emerging cases. And we've seen the war in Ukraine, and we've seen some good market interventions in Europe, and we've seen less good market inter interventions, and we've seen intentions to intervene that ultimately didn't happen, fortunately. But market interventions is a risk because it distorts the, the market functioning and it distorts the long-term incentive to invest. Uh, regulated tariffs, there's also distortion. Uh, there is a different penetration of regulated tariffs depending on the market, but even in markets like in the UK, where allegedly the market was uh, liberalized, we've seen caps on, on, on the liberalized tariffs. So this is something that we believe doesn't help. Uh, the elephant in the room is the network, is the grid, the electrical grid. Uh, we have studies that demonstrate that for each euro invested in generation, in renewable generation, you need another euro invested in, in the smart grids. And we don't see, well, in the last maybe one year, one year and a half, we see the European Union coming into this type of rationale and, and understanding and pushing for networks investment. So when you think about emerging countries, it's not only about generation fleet. Transmission and distribution is a key element for decarbonizing the economy. And finally, but not, 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 uh, not less important, fiscal policies. And believe it or not, still we have fossil fuel usage mm. being subsidized in many countries. And there is a differential between taxing electricity and, and, and fossil fuels that should be, should be uh, eliminated. Um, in, that, in that arena, we can also propose uh, to use some of the tax income coming, for instance, from the ETS, European Trading System, or from carbon taxes, or from the fuel taxation, divert it into promoting renewables, infrastructures, transmission distribution, and also, uh, if, if this is needed, vulnerable customers, whenever the transition may affect them, or even some employees in industries that may disappear, okay? So those type of ideas are universal. Yeah. And when we see success, it's because those ideas are being implemented. When we see failures, something is missing there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating on that. I think it's really helpful to draw that connection to show the interdependencies between corporate action and where there needs to be a supportive regulatory um, context. And I think that's really where we're hoping to provide more information with ASCOR, especially on fossil fuel subsidies. That's an indicator we assess. So stay tuned for November where we'll publish the state of transition and sovereigns. Um, so coming back to um, the sort of investor perspective, asset owner, asset manager, um, just between the both of you, um, what would you say are the most important gaps in terms of corporate climate data? 
or maybe asset management services that you're not easily finding. Um, and this is kind of for us, what data do you need? What, how should we be refining it? What, um, what are the main gaps? Sure. So I think, I mean, again, I'm going to talk about the emerging market perspective mm -hmm. and how that um, kind of plays out, I guess, from a, from a manager's perspective. But I think, you know, standards, tools, regulations are mostly developed in developed markets by developed markets for developed markets with modifications for emerging markets. Um, I think your first slide was such a great example of the data issue. Like, if we all allocated capital based on, um, you know, data available that was sufficient in your slide, Africa would never see a dime because there was insufficient data for every country other than South Africa. Um, so that is, you know, it, it is a great example of why data needs to be more focused on, but also there needs to be um, allowances and sort of freedom a little bit with when dealing with emerging market companies and emerging market sovereigns, um, but also like strong advocacy for them to disclose because it is such an investment imperative for those companies and for those regions. Um, I think data can also be misleading. I think, I mean, Roberto, we, we were talking just before this, Iberdrola is such a great example. We, we um, have Iberdrola in our house portfolio. Um, and when we started looking into the climate transition, we, when, when we committed to net zero, we looked at our entire house portfolio. We looked at our entire house portfolio based on emissions alone. So we filtered for companies highest to lowest. And Iberdrola was in the list of the top 50 companies in our uh, top 50 highest emitters in our, in our um, house portfolio. So if you look at emissions alone and you have an emissions alone target, there would be impetus to say, actually, Iberdrola, you, you know, it, it, we have a very big position, it's a big emitter, we can't invest in you. But as soon as you move beyond the emissions alone and look at the detail of the company's transition plan, and this is why, you know, we need to speak about data and different data points. There are different indicators that you need to look for. CapEx allocation, for instance, you have what 40 billion euros of CapEx allocated to transition over the next three yeah. years or something. 98% of the eligible CapEx is aligned with the European taxonomy. Beautiful. Exactly. I mean, what a beautiful stat. And so data is important, but the, the type of data is even more important, I would say. Um, and I think bringing that nuance into the conversation is super important because we need to move beyond just emissions. It's so much more important to know what a company is doing in the next five to 10 years with their balance sheet than it is to know what their emissions were in financial year 23. I then think the other important point is dividing this conversation up into debt and equity. So from an equity perspective, um, companies, you know, when, when we look at equities, public equities, Disclosure on public equities in emerging markets is nowhere near developed markets. And, you know, we have CDP, many of you will be in, involved with or know the CDP, so we, dis, we campaign all of our companies to disclose the CDP. But a lot of the issue with corporates is the sovereign, not, you know, it's the regulatory environment. It's exactly your point. It's, you know, in South Korea, if you are Samsung, um, your entire transition plan is conditional on the regulation of the South Korean government. Mm -hmm. So do we engage with the company or do we engage, engage with the sovereign? And then on debt, um, just before I came here, we were hosting a round table for the private infrastructure development group Pitch, who we manage a blended finance fund on their behalf. And one of the board members of Pitch was saying she's, you know, for the last 40 years, in the 1980s, she was working in ODA, and she, very, you know, she was working in the deployment of ODA capital into Africa, and there was no private investment in Africa. It was only ODA. 40 years later, you know, here we are. She's sitting on one of the biggest blended finance funds in the world, and it's 1.2 billion dollars investing in Africa. It's nothing, absolutely nothing. But the problem is, is that there is very little commercial data 
on debt and infrastructure. Investors, private investors, want commercial evidence of risk, uh, loss ratios, returns, um, uh, default rates, and because very little private sector investment has been made over the last mm. 30 years, we have very little evidence on which to go off to be able to deploy more capital into mm. debt markets in, in emerging markets. So mm. complex um, and lots of gaps to plug, but I think things like um, ASCO, for instance, is an amazing tool to help overcome that. I know the GEMS database that has recently been released mm -hmm. um, by MDBs and, and you know, more data from the MDBs is very welcome for private investors that are looking mm -hmm. to invest in these regions and into these sectors. Cool, thank you. Laura, other gaps and missing pieces? Um, from my perspective, one of the biggest, um, I guess, like, problems is that if you are very focused on decarbonizing your portfolio and so you're looking at portfolio emissions data, if you were to sort of say, hey, we, we agree with you know what I said earlier about we need to get into EM, we need to increase our allocation into EM, and you went and did that, your financed emissions would immediately go up. So if you're tracking, so I, I very much agree with what you said about needing to focus on the right data points, because if you focus on that data point, you're going to want to reduce your exposure to EM, not increase it. And so I think firstly that's a problem and I think what I'd love to see is more asset owners just reporting on what their allocation is to EM and trying to make commitments, whether that's a, whether that's a target or a commitment, I don't, I don't really mind, but find a way to have some kind of internal commitment that you're actually not going to decrease as a starting point because I think that's a really good first starting point. And then look at options for you to increase. So I think in terms of increasing um, allocations, I think there's a few kind of chicken and eggy things going on with the data question because fundamentally, um, to your point, there aren't enough asset managers who have really significant expertise in these markets. And if you're an asset owner looking for a, a climate transition investment opportunity in an EM, you're going to be looking for an asset manager that is highly skilled, that has a team that completely get the asset class, they get the jurisdiction, they've had plenty of time and hands on the ground actually doing these investment opportunities. And that will help you build kind of the confidence that you need. That's alongside the data. But I would even say in the absence of the data, if you have a team who really know their stuff, that really helps build the confidence. But I think we've got, as I said, kind of a chicken and eggy situation going on here where we kind of need data to get more asset managers in who are upskilling themselves and who are learning how to do this and who are practicing, that then we can build the confidence within asset ownership. But I do think it goes in the other direction too. And you know, I think um, we as asset owners need to be much more proactive, particularly if we take the view that you know I, I mentioned earlier, we think this is really important. We really need to be getting in here and looking for these investment opportunities to actually go back to asset managers and go, we're really interested in this and this is what we need. Because I would say the other gap for us has been, we did a bit of an assessment of what are the climate transition opportunities in EM a few months ago? And we just found there weren't that many, um, to be frank. Most of the ones that exist are very focused on financed emissions and reducing those emissions in, in line with the benchmark. So say there's sort of like a, a benchmark tracker, but they make sure that you um, drop 45% from uh, emissions from 20, 2020 to 2030 in alignment with the Paris Agreement. That's not a great real economy impact way of going about this. What you would actually want is something that really focuses on those real world outcomes, which might be metrics like avoided emissions, it might be um, met metrics like reduced emissions. So looking at different ways and, and really having a, an asset manager who has a really thoughtful theory of change. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of those opportunities currently, and I'd really like to see this change, but a lot of those opportunities currently are tricky for investors like us to invest in, sometimes because they lack liquidity. For example, if they're infrastructure, they really lack liquidity. Sometimes if they're more kind of closed-ended structures, they can be quite hard. You've kind of got to put that money away and you can't even add more money to that. So there's a whole range of different issues. And, and also sometimes there are asset classes we just don't invest in as well. So there's a whole range of issues there, but I think there's a sort of a big constellation of solutions as well that we, mm -hmm. could, we could start to work on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I sort of organized the panel roughly um, to have first, in the first half, which we've just finished, 
what are all the problems, what are all the gaps, what are the challenges, what are the interdependencies, why can't anybody get forward um, to, to kind of pull back the image Simon drew earlier. Um, but if we move to solutions, what can we do? What should be done? Um, I'd like to start with, with you, Roberto. Um, what motivated Iberdrola to set a net zero target that is as ambitious that it is? So it's 2030. As an EU-based uh, headquartered company, it aligns with the regional benchmark that we have, um, which is 2035, if you remember. So they're even five years before that. So can you tell us what made that motivation, what brought that ability to align um, sure. like that? Well, uh, benchmarks reflect a relative position. Uh, in our case, we look very nicely in the benchmark because we are 80% below our pe European peers in carbon emissions, scope one carbon emissions. But the relevance of the benchmarks is how they influence the stakeholders that influence us, okay? And we have too many stakeholders that influence our strategy. We as a corporate, every corporate in the world, investors, shareholders, and second, the uh, regulators, in terms of energy policy in our case. Uh, so uh, the question is how we can make those benchmarks influence those guys, okay? Uh, in our case, uh, our uh, change in the business model from a classical vertically integrated utility it started like 15, 20 years ago. Uh, at the time, uh, the board could, was able to foresee that renewables could play a real role in producing electricity from renewables in a massive way, which was something very disputed at the time. Having so, having decided so early in time to take this, this switch, we have had the time, for instance, to close all our coal facilities. It was a coal-free utility. We closed 8,000 megawatts, I think we ended three years ago. Uh, so being early in time was important for us to take the time to take the, the measures that we had to take. Uh, the result, as, I, as, as you said, uh, we, we, we are much lower in, in carbon emissions, scope one, and uh, due to that, we think we are able to, to get the neutrality in generation by 2030, which is five years earlier than, than your 2035 figures. Uh, so we, we take benefit of, of that very early movement, but things have changed, and today the technology is not disputed. We know that technologically, the utility sector can become carbon-free, almost carbon-free, as, as quick as we want. Uh, so the question is, and the example is Spain. In the last five years, from 2019 to 2030, 18,000 megawatts of solar capacity have been installed, and five to 6,000 megawatts of wind capacity, multiplied by, I don't know, one million uh, per megawatt. I mean, this is an enormous amount of capex deployed. Uh, due to that, in the, in the first six months of 2024, 70% of the electricity produced in Spain is carbon free. Out of those 70, 50%, by 50 percentual points, so 50, then 20, then 70, 50 is coming from renewables. Uh, so this is achievable. In some of the days in Spain, 65% of the electricity is coming from renewables, and specific hours, 80, 85%. So it can be done, it should be done. So uh, why, why so why, why we are lagging in other jurisdictions, in other places? Uh, I think that the, the elephant in the room here, again, is the demand, is the, is the energy usage in other industries. Uh, as I said at the beginning of, the, of this panel, we believe that electrifying the economy is the only answer to become net zero, not in the utility sector, in the whole of the economy. Uh, and we are not alone in this conviction. I think the International uh, Energy Agency agrees, and they said that to electrify the economy, the amount of renewable megawatts has to triple from uh, 2020 to 2030. So this conviction is well spread. Which are the barriers? First of all, we stress everything related investment in grid, because we are experiencing bottlenecks. Grid has to be the, the permitting process has to be uh, faster. It is too slow. The immigration schemes are too inflexible. And something that the regulator should take into account is the long-term planning is very relevant. The regulators used to, 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 to update the long-term planning every three to five years. Now they should do it annually because the demand mm. is so mm. rapidly increasing in specific places that you, not, you cannot keep a long-term planning uh, built up three years ago. Um, Secondly, and I go wider right now, we need to support, uh, especially with public funds, and I connect my idea here with the Draghi report, which was issued, I think, yesterday, we need to use public funds. What was done with renewables, renewables took like 
one decade of subsidies. Now, you are the, now they are the cheapest way of producing electricity. So what was done through public support with renewables could be done in other industries, thinking about mobility, transportation, heating, whatever. Uh, we need to accelerate that. And the private capital has a limit to the risk we can take, they can take. And that is a difficulty also in emerging countries. Mm -hmm. So we need a public commitment for, from the member states to encourage R&D to decarbonize those industry sectors that can be decarbonized. We, we know that some of these sectors can be decarbonized right now. We think transportation is, is a fact. We think heating is another big chunk of the CO2 emissions. Uh, and there are some other more difficult sectors, but you need to put money to invest and to create R&D to support that. Other big countries, China and Asia, America and the United States are, are doing so. So we think that as Europeans, we need to support this learning curve on, of other industries because ultimately the utility sector is like, I don't know, 30% of the total carbon emissions. You have mm -hmm. the 70% uh, yeah. on the other side. As, as a summary, we can do that. We, th we think that we have the technology. This is achievable. We need to mobilize the funds. And, uh, and, and going back in time, I remember uh, like 10 years ago when we thought about decarbonizing the system, uh, people o o very frequently thought about the trilemma, the dilemma, mm -hmm. trilemma. And they mm -hmm. said, you have environmental protection, you have affordability, and you have security supply. Mm -hmm. A lot of people said, you cannot have it all. Mm -hmm. Maybe one, occasionally two of the three elements. Now we can have it all mm -hmm. because we have the right technology and it's efficient and it's competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this also speaks to the special place that the electricity sector has. And it's really advanced, it's really ahead. And I think it's it's not an accident or it's not um, unintentional that this is the sector where we've added regional benchmarks so that you can, th this, in one of its use cases, it allows investors to see which companies based in developed markets are ahead of the curve. They're, they're genuine leaders, they're way ahead. Um, because there are other companies based in Europe who align with the global benchmark, the global net zero uh, deadline, but not with the regional one. And to be able to distinguish that is, is really um, quite helpful for a sector that is this far ahead in, in the transition. Um, so moving to um, back to the asset manager uh, perspective, um, I wanted to come back to this question of investor expectations and sort of how exactly do you think investors should be adjusting their expectations? Um, what are your thoughts on that idea of uh, exemptions? Is that going too far? Um, yeah, that'd be great to, to hear from you. Thanks. So um, I think it's good, you know, you should have a set of expectations because those expectations effectively align with your values as a manager or as an asset owner um, and what you believe to be possible and true. However, being pragmatic and realistic about that in reality is the only way you will ever get to that outcome. So um, adjusting your expectation or rather meeting the company regardless of where they are, you know, meeting the company where they are regardless of the region where they are mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is super important because imposing um, an energy utility transition plan in the UK on one in South Africa when the one in South Africa is 95% coal mm. is just completely unrealistic. Yeah. And I think it's unfortunately where a lot of the investor investee relationship has broken down and where mm. a lot of this whole transition plan narrative and expectation has broken down is misunderstanding of the technicalities and the capital constraints of a lot of the companies in emerging markets. So I think that's really the starting point. I also think it's, I feel like I've, I've said mostly sort of negative things so far, but so just to kind of shine a very positive light on it. We have seen, and this is why we make the commercial case for investing in emerging markets in a transition. In the last 30 years, 32 years of investing in these regions, we have seen some companies and some countries be far ahead of their developed market competitors. We have seen innovation, leadership, commercial cases with really strong returns, really low risks, and really high integrity plans in countries like Namibia, um, Kenya, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Vietnam, Slovenia, countries where you know people 
you know, asset managers and asset owners don't usually go. And the reason why we have seen them and why we invest in them and why we have made, you know, really a good, have made strong commercial returns from them is because we're on the ground and we do the work. We're not relying on um, a data point that hasn't been verified or quite frankly hasn't been checked because that country is too hard to go to. You have to sometimes roll up your sleeves, put on your boots and do a little bit of dirty work to really find the gems. And this year we launched um, a fund called the Emerging Market Transition Debt Fund. And it was a fund that was launched out of many conversations with some of our clients who wanted to invest in emerging markets, wanted to invest in transition, couldn't find the right product, you know, wanted to bring in all these thematics into one place. And so we did that, we designed the product, we, we worked on the frameworks that provided the integrity around what transition actually means, around measuring the um, you know, actual benefits of transition through carbon avoided and carbon reduced. That's something we did with CDP. And we have now raised this fund and we have invested in a suite of companies and projects. So it's a debt fund, public and private debt. It's very unique split 50-50, the types of companies that we're looking at are like low carbon data centers in Namibia, which sounds you know, like the most random thing ever, but you go, to these, you go to these companies and they are massive and they are so productive and they are not just, you know, those, those are the data centers that are gonna fuel other economy, micro economies in the region. Mm -hmm. They are green steel manufacturers in Slovenia. You know, a, a, and, and, and what once was a local steel manufacturer is now going to be a, you know, Eastern European's biggest green steel mm -hmm. manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Unless you go there and know and have the appetite and have the mandate, mm -hmm. very important, like to have the mandate from your clients to go there. Mm -hmm. as, an, as, as an asset manager, that's, you know, the greatest kind of gift that we could be given is to deploy capital into these excellent companies mm -hmm. and projects that align with the investor appetite. So um, the opportunity is 100% there. Mm -hmm. I'll, you know, albeit slightly more difficult and challenging with these data issues that we've spoken of, yeah. um, but it's definitely doable, yeah. and we hope to do more of it. That's that's really brilliant to hear about. I have another question for Laura, but I think it might make sense to take questions from the audience first. Um, but maybe I'll pose it, and you can weave it in in case it relates to some of the other questions. Um, I was just curious about this activity, this uh, exercise of integrating corporate and sovereign climate engagement, doing that at different scales um, as an asset owner. Sorry, the mic is cutting in and out. Um, so it would be great if we could take some questions. I'll take two from the audience, then we'll answer them. Yes, please. <laughs> and then we'll take maybe two online uh, after responding. Brilliant panel. Um, Anika, you are inspirational, thank you. Uh, Andrew Webster, World Benchmarking Alliance. I lead the finance benchmark and um, love what you're doing. Um, really spot on. A um, couple of questions. Um, we are obsessed about emerging markets as well, so a lot of what you've been talking about makes my heart sing. Uh, in terms of how we increase allocation, I've got a, a question, and Nick, you might have touched on this. Um, my previous experience in finance is that um, it can allocate data when there isn't enough, that it can allocate when there isn't enough data. It happens every day in finance and emerging markets. It's where assumptions are making. It's usually where you have an investment edge. So I think just flagging that, that I'm interested in your thoughts on how profound the data is in terms of holding back allocation. Um, but my bigger question is around how do we increase allocation and what levers do we pull? Um, you mentioned ODA, Anika, but for me, I'm wondering your view on FDI, so the flip side of the same coin, and then also where that links to liquidity, because so much we talk about in developed markets is in obviously enlisted, but the opportunities, I think, in emerging markets are in private markets. So, you know, that's where we're going to really shift. So I'd love, what is it that asset owners can do to help with that shift to private markets and emerging markets? Um, and probably around there, is there any rules of the games that can change in terms of track record, liquidity, size of the fund that might help us push these allocations and, uh, and what we can ask of asset owners? Thank you. Thanks so much. Do we have one other question from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Just wait for the mic one moment. Sorry. 
just wait for the mic. I'm sorry, I also so, forgot. You, you introduced yourself very kindly. If you could start by hi, introducing yourself. Hi, Catherine Blanc. Uh, I've been an investor in emerging market um, uh, from the investment banking side and wealth management in the last 20 years, uh, mostly corporate bonds. And sustainability has been a subject very dear to me, but I was actually quite depressed recently because none of my investors were um, interested in sustainability. And pushing it with management, there was no one there. Uh, I've been regularly attending the IMTA conferences, the JP Morgan Emerging Market Conference, and sustainability is one hour, you know, subject of a two-day um, conference and you look at the MBI, the, um, the benchmark, there's not really a sustainability aspect into it. Uh, there was the Braskem scandal um, last December, you know, with the, which is the largest petrochemical company in Brazil and having the a collapse of a salt mine and uh, when you were reading um, analyst um, uh, reports, they were only looking at the uh, provisions against potential damage, and uh, the bonds have rallied back to where they were, uh, you know, not, notwithstanding the damage which happened uh, there. So how do, would you reconcile, um, you had a very optimistic note, but I think the, the, the bunch of emerging market, uh, dedicated emerging market investors don't really care for sustainability. Uh, maybe pension funds, but the others don't really. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Let's go if we can do kind of briefly one or two minute maximum um, any response you have to these questions and we'll leave it there. Yeah, I mean, I think they're both excellent questions. I guess a couple of things that I would say is that I do think unlocking the asset owner interest in and motivation to invest in these areas is really critical. And that's because I think, as Annika said, you know, you get the mandate from the your, your client and then you can go and do these things and I think the more demand we have for that which is I would say why I think it's really important for asset owners to start thinking about building out climate action plans that explicitly make clear commitments have a clear rationale have a clear theory of change around how they're going to deal with emerging markets and I would say that because you know the point that I made earlier about 95% of emissions growth is coming from that part of the world if you're putting together a plan and you're saying hey we really care about addressing climate as a systemic risk and you're not dealing with that that just seems like a really big gap right so I think we do need to deal with that there's a, there's a whole range of things, though, that need to change in order for that to happen in a big way. Some of it is, to your point about private markets, that is really tricky for a lot of investors to do. You know, and I think, you know, we all have a retirement savings, hopefully, and you, you want those savings to be managed really responsibly and thoughtfully. And as a result of that, and regulation that is very well intentioned, pension funds are some of the more conservative investors around, right? And I think that's a good thing, but I think we have to find ways to make sure. And so blended finance is often touted as one of the opportunities to do this. It's probably not gonna be able to be scalable enough to do this in the way that we actually need, because there simply isn't going to be enough public finance to kind of de-risk the private finance that needs to be going in. But I think we need to think about this in a much more thoughtful way, but I think a lot of it actually starts with that signaling, demonstration, leadership, that I was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Any further thoughts from, uh, sorry, Roberto or Annika? Well, basically, Briefly. Uh, I mean, for us, everything is about risk return. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a portion of our portfolio, as I told you, in, in a couple of countries, Brazil and Mexico. They behave in a different way. Uh, uh, Brazil is a fantastic good example, as I, as I told you. And we are happy to invest. Uh, the, mass, the, the most we can. So, uh, in our view, it's everything about incentives. Mm -hmm. And we need to be aware that the private capital has a limit to the risk they can assume. Absolutely. So, uh, then you have to play in a different way in different places, depending on, on the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Any final remarks? Just quickly, okay. um, yes. sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch your name or where you're from, but and we can talk about this afterwards, but I think it's such a fantastic pain point that you just expressed because that's not just what we experience with raising capital. Um, you know, it's also what we experience with managing existing capital where this room is full of like-minded people who it's almost, you could say, an echo chamber where we all believe that, mm. are believing and speaking about the same thing. There is a very big room out there that 
is pulling in the opposite direction or is completely neutral. And so um, on, I think the, the, the biggest point is your point actually, which is about risk return. As soon as what we are talking about affects the risk or the return, everyone listens. Um, and I think you know the way that we would talk about it, I was in Namibia last week for the um, Africa Hydrogen Conference, and the way that you talk, the, the way that the local um, institutions, whether it's pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, or ministers of finance in the region talk about this opportunity is not about climate or transition, it's about industrialization, it's about development, it's about investing in an ever expanding opportunity. And I think language is important because ultimately, we're all actually talking about the same thing. It's just a different use of language. Sustainability, some people see as philanthropy. And actually, it's a massive commercial opportunity that we should all just be mm. behind and should be completely implicit in how we do and how we operate. Um, and so, you know, talking about it, I mean, here we are talking about it, so it's very contradictory, but but marketing it and talking about it um, sometimes backfires because ultimately mm. you could lose a whole pool of capital just because you use the wrong word, but ultimately mm. the objective still remains the same. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, just as a very brief closing remark, I think a few interesting things that have come out, um, one in particular that I'm going to take away to my work, which is that we shouldn't conflate the income level of, of a country and its regulatory um, environment, its level of regulatory rigor, with the example of Brazil, but also um, similarly there are brilliant opportunities um, of real transition, real rigor in transition planning um, outside of developed markets. So if we, it's very heartening to, to hear that there are investors in this space that are aware of that and are looking for those opportunities. So please.